We are here at the MAPS Air Museum with Jean Gent. Today is April 4th, 2019, and we are, at, oh, we are at the MAPS Air Museum to talk about her time in the Royal Air Force. Can you give me a little bit of history of your childhood? Well, I was one of five. I had four brothers. Um, uh, I went to a girls' school, and my brothers went to a boys' school. That's how it was in those days. Um, and I didn't live in the city, but I went to a school in the city. And uh, we were expected to get on a bus, even at um, age... I probably was went with somebody until I was about age seven. My father dropped us off and we came home on a bus halfway and then I had to catch a public bus to get and we all did it, we just that's what we did. And when I was a little older, I went on the bus right to the terminal and walked a mile and a half to school. And later I cycled all the way five miles to school. So, um, well, oh, difference too. I belonged to a school which was finished in 1928 and they had scraped the playing fields flat and put all the dirt at the earth at one end of the playing fields and it was called the hump. So when war broke out, or just before, they started digging tunnels in there for air raid shelters. And when war broke out, another school in the city had, didn't have any air raid shelters, so they we went, they went mornings one month and, and afternoons the other, and we went the other, uh, other way around. So we had to be at school, it seemed to be at 7, and then we finished at 12, or we started at 12, 13, finished at 5, or something like that. It was rather difficult. Mm -hmm. But we still had gas and um, petrol, so my father could drop us off in the morning anyway. So um, We weren't terribly... Uh, aware of the war to begin with. It, it was another year and a half before we were really aware of it. And a friend of mine had a brother who was at Dunkirk and he escaped and his mother came running down the, the road waving her telegram. She said, oh, Collins free, Collins free. That was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I lived between two um, uh, small aerodromes where they trained the pilots and uh, the, the pilots were uh, navigators or people who went went up in the air <coughs> when I was stationed around us with families and uh, um, it was interesting because you if I hear a bi little biplane going over I'm back in my garden I could hear it But it's a, an odd sound, a twin, a little twin plane prop going, it has a same sound, I hear it occasionally here. But um, we had pilots, all, we were conscious of them all the time, they were all around us, because one was about a mile, a mile and a half away, and the other one was probably five miles away, but they were very small aerodromes. Um, Later on, when after I can't really say when, but probably 43, 44, um, when I was cycling home from school, when there would be um, what do you call it when trucks follow our trucks, a convoys, Convoy. mm -hmm. convoys of army um, vans going south, and they would of course would whistle at you or anything, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But um, we were aware, very aware then that something was going to happen, but we, not, not consciously because of around us, but because the movement on the road was all going south, and we lived on the main road, so I was conscious of that. Um, we were all issued with gas masks, and you've probably seen pictures of them, little cardboard, square cardboard boxes with string, and um, very quickly you tried to put something a bit more thick around your neck. Uh, I think Mother gave bought us canvas ones or maybe denim, I don't remember that, but later on we all had leather ones 
and then we would keep our combs and our everything we shouldn't have had in there. We had warning when we were going to have a gastrol, so we got rid of those. And <laughs> so when you took it out, it didn't all fall all over the ground. Um, and so you had to learn how to put those on, and you learn how to um, kind of defog them when you you fog them off when you put them on, but. You, we never had to use them, except when we had drills, we had to run out to these um, um, area shelters um, and two, two girls at a time had to, to turn the handles of the fans to keep the ventilation going. But we never air, ever had an air raid drill during the day. Uh, Leicester, the big town where I lived near, I uh, did have some, and they did have some bombing, but not an awful lot. It was a clean city. Now, Birmingham's not too far south, and Derby, uh, where they used to build trains, was further north, so they were making tanks and that sort of thing up there. And Coventry was only 40 miles away, and we saw Coventry burn. Father came in one night, and he said, come and look at this. So we went out of the door and looked, and he said, that's Coventry, and it was. And then when you were 16, you had to fire, fire um, what do they call it? Just be there overnight in case there was a, a fire or anything and, and warn people and that sort of thing. And uh, I think you did that about every two months. Every, we took turns, mm -hmm. we did about every two months. Um, and they would give you a, a breakfast in the morning. So. So you were awake all night long to you know, monitor? You, could, you had um, cots you could sleep on. You had to take, make tea and deliver it to the staff in the staff room. And I can't even remember where we slept. I, I, I have no idea, but it was somewhere, <laughs> presumably with a curtain. I don't remember. I went in the air, I saw, I wanted to go in the Air Force, and I saw that it, it was open for um, volunteer. In, in 1945, and I said to my mother, I want to do this. She said, um, oh, I don't know. My father didn't want me to go, but um, because I was only 17 and a half. So I, went, I volunteered, and, and I um, was accepted. And um, I had to go on a train to Birmingham to do um, testing and stuff like that. And... Um, I got into to be something called a tracer. A tracer worked in the photographic library, and when the air aeroplanes made their runs back and forth like this, um, the f photographs were, uh, I don't know how it was done, but they were mapped and put on a map. And the uh, key to it was the height, the date, the height, and um, and a number, and those came to us. And we had to trace them onto starched linen, and you use special pens and colours to do that. And then you mean the code below. So if you wanted to look up a certain place, and what was happening at that time, and the people came in all the time to look at them, were you looked for the area that you and the map you wanted. And then you looked at all these start sheets and see you could find near the date when you're looking for. And the height made a lot of difference. And the, the time, the, the, like the, the date. And then they had a number and you could go to the library. And they were all in little, I would say, nine inch square boxes. And you could go and they would fetch those films for you to look at. That's how it was done. And we slept in Nissen huts. Do you know what a Nissen hut is? No, I know what a Quonson hut yes. is, but is well, that the same? Well, maybe you call them Quonset. They were round. Uh, like yes. a half metal? Yeah, right, and okay. they had a shelf along the line, okay. and they had a stove in the middle. And uh, I don't know two, three, four, five. There were probably about 14 girls slept in one. And then the evolution, they all join a corridor, and the um, ablutions, that means the wash um, basins and the um, toilets and the showers were all up 
at one end, so you had to trail up there. And when it was very cold, we washed our faces at night and then took our face cloths back with us and put them on the shelf. And they were frozen in the morning, but you did this and washed your face. That was about all you did. <laughs> It was very cold until there was a fire that's in mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. In the evenings it was quite warm. Mm -hmm. uh, you were all part of the photography yeah. group? Mm -hmm. All the photographs taken in Europe, and I don't know when this ended, but when when I left there were still all the photographs taken in Europe by the, the British, the French, the Americans, Canadians, whoever was doing mm -hmm. it were sent there, and they still are, if you read that uh, article. Mm. Uh, and what was the unit? Did they have an, a number uh, what, or a name? Uh, um, well, it was Medrinum, but uh, they, it was just called the photographic unit. Okay. They talked about moving us when I was there to another place uh, called Benson, but Benson moved their stuff over to us instead. Um, when we were there, there were when I first went there, and I was the youngest on the station. Um, there were there were Americans, and Canadians, and um, some French. There were quite a lot of different um, people from different areas, but that was because it was intelligence headquarters too. And the other unit that was there was the model section. That was incredible, and you can see these models in the uh, aeronautic section in the Air Museum in Washington and um, um, there were, uh, there's one in um, the War Memorial uh, Museum in London mm -hmm. that I've seen. I saw um, the Mona Dam that was, the models were built for that with every tree that they knew was there was on the model mm -hmm. and they did the beaches too. And those were wonderful people, um, very artistic people, very clever, um, but really nice. Mm. And uh, I was fortunate to know someone of them too. Um, now, why did you decide to go into the Royal Air Force? Oh, well, I thought flying was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly didn't want to go. To, I don't like the sea, so I wouldn't want to go in that. And, and you, I didn't want to go in the Army, so the Army uh, police was the Air Force. Were there a lot of young women doing that at the time? Um, when I joined, there were a lot. And we all had been tested for what we could do. And for some reason, only four of us were chosen to be t um, tracers. Um, a lot of them was, uh, did secretarial work, or there were, you know, there was cooks and things like this. Mm -hmm. They would need cooks and cleaners and things like. Mm -hmm. And some people did it to get away from home, but I wasn't doing it for that reason. Mm -hmm. What kind of training did you have for your job? None. None? none? Just on the job? Yes, just, what just you on got the there? job. This is what you do. And uh, if you, you, it was far more complicated than just that. Sometimes you had to make the, the, the plots that you were drawing bigger, or sometimes you had to re reduce them and use the machine, or you used some, um, I can't remember what it was, but you, you drew here and the pencil did it over here. Okay. Um, and the, the meals were all right. There was a, <clears throat> you go and went over to the mess halls and outside but there was always hot water in a large, shallow kind of sink to clean off your knife and fork and spoon when you finished and you had a little thing you kept them in. Oh, so you kept your silverware with you? Yes, okay. always. And uh, <laughs> I came out of the Air Force, in, I think it was February um, 48, and, my, and I met my husband in 48, and he was still in the Army, but he was in the Army Education Corps, and uh, he came out in about May, I don't know, maybe it was earlier than that, maybe it was April. And we got married in September. I, I really, with the, considering it, I didn't know him. I mean, <laughs> really, I, I saw him like every other weekend. Ah. And we didn't live at home, we moved, because um, he got a job as a research worker. And, uh, later he came to this country as a professor. Um,